thank you for for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. I always like to talk about machines. Uh, machine ethics is really my thing these days. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna share my screen with you. Let me just um, try to do this right. Those are my contact details. If somebody wants to, he hasn't had enough of uh, of machine ethics. So what I'm gonna tell you today. I'm going to start with AI. I'm going to not tell you anything that you don't know, but because there is so much that has been written about AI and ethics and morality and ethical AI and so on, I, I actually uh, am going to, in effect, spend half of the talk discerning things in order to be able to better position uh, what we talk about when we talk about um, machine ethics specifically. So that means also introducing this very, what has now become very large landscape of ethics and AI, what, and just very briefly try to, to paint this position, these pieces in the landscape and position machine ethics in this landscape. So uh, then half of the, the second half of the talk is what is machine ethics? Why do we care about this thing? And how do we actually make machine ethics? What do people research when we research machine ethics? So I have included a little bit of references in the slides, but by all means do get in touch with me and ask, or just after the talk, ask me for, for, for more references. All right, so from the beginning, everybody has their own favorite definition of what artificial intelligence is. And we all know that there exists no one good true definition of what artificial intelligence is. I like the one from Bellman, uh, which he pu puts in his book in from 1978. And he says, Artificial intelligence is the automation of activities that we associate with human thinking, um, such as, for example, namely cognitive activities. Right? I have this nice timeline here just to remind people that uh, artificial intelligence as a research has an exact date when it starts, it's 1956. And as applications, in fact, artificial intelligence is something that we have had since the, um, since the 80s. Uh, so we have been here before friends where artificial intelligence has been popular. And people have in fact discussed um, all kinds of issues. What impact does artificial intelligence have on a person, on society and so on in the past as well. So then the question of course, that I don't think I need to particularly answer for this conference is why do we want to automate cognition? This is simple because we want to automate tasks that people do not want to do. And these are dangerous tasks, damaging tasks, damaging tasks, boring tasks. So you cannot do everything with pure automation of movement. Uh, some tasks such as, for instance, picking strawberries, picking tomatoes, um, they require that you do some cognition, recognizing that the fruit is ripe, uh, taking only the fruit without damaging the plant, um, and uh, also having the right amount of grip, for example, as well as to not damage the fruit when you pick it. It's a very simple example. Now, uh, automating cognition is different than uh, automating movement. Uh, this uh, picture that I have here is um, a very nice illustration I find of how automation of movement is executed. Um, in, when you automate movement, what you do is you basically replace the, move, the limb with a copy of a limb executed in some different medium, such as, I don't know, wood or metal or plastic or whatever you want, or a combination of all of those. Um, and then you just uh, decompose the movement so the movement is fully decomposable and then you replicate each element. And then when they're put together or they, when they're done in unity, you get exact replica of the movement. When we are automating cognitive tasks, actually what we're trying to do is having exactly the same approach. Because if you remember what a computer is, a computer is pre precisely just movement. Like a Turing machine has the head of the machine that moves alongside this state. So what we are in fact doing when we're automating cognition is we are replacing cognition with movement again. And we are taking the same approach. We are decomposing cognition. We are taking different types of cognition and we are automating, replacing it, finding a way to mimic it with movement. In fact, well, programs, right? So a bit more abstract level um, with, with the computer. So to illustrate how this is done, um, just we are looking at one cognitive process and that is the process of reasoning and I choose this one because it serves me later when I talk to you about machine ethics but also because it's the, the reasoning that is the process that we most connect with with intelligence 
So just to motivate this type of thinking, why I was thinking this, it's like, imagine how a mouse trap works, right? You put um, a banana in a uh, vessel that has a small opening in which the monkey can put in the hand um, freely, but it cannot take out uh, the banana once it has grabbed it in the box. And since the, the monkey does not want to get, get um, does not want to release the banana, it's just trapped there and people capture it. And we think of this behavior as stupid. There is no reasoning here. Uh, and because, and when I say there is no reasoning, because it's, in this case, we are thinking about reasoning um, as the process of using rules to connect cause and effect. So the monkey cannot connect the cause of its being trapped, which is um, I'm still holding on to the banana uh, with the effect. Um, all right. So there are three types of logic reasoning, which are the three types of reasoning that we are basically automating in artificial intelligence. Uh, the first one, uh, if we are given some facts and some rules, and we, want to and we want to find answers that are entailed by these facts using these rules, uh, is called deductive reasoning. So this is deduction. Here's a little toy example of a problem that requires deductive reasoning. Uh, imagine that we are somewhere in the handmade, made, ha, ha, sorry, handmade tale um, universe. So you have, for example, George is looking at Jane. Uh, Jane is looking at Jack. This is some social situation. George is married. Jack is not married. And we want to find out, uh, prudes that we are, whether there is somebody married that is looking at somebody who is unmarried. And in order to do that, we require deduction. I'm not going to give you the answer. You can kind of uh, play with it. Uh, this is a very popular puzzle. I'm sure you've seen it before. Uh, so that's deduction. Um, the if we, instead of uh, being given the cause and the, and the rules and look for what the effects are, we can be given the effects and we can give, be given rules. And we would like to find a way to explain um, these effects, to find what are the causes. Uh, how is this state possible? So to do that, what we use is uh, what is known as abductive reason. So, or abduction, right? Uh, so for example, uh, solving a Sudoku puzzle requires abductive reasoning. We are trying to find what is the original full um, grid in which uh, the grid in which every, every cell has a number in it. What is the one grid that has, how can we, that allows for these numbers to be in the positions in which that they're given? Or a little bit more intuitively, abduction is basically what Sherlock Holmes does whenever they, he does these clever things that he, he is um, seen doing in whatever edition of that story. And lastly, if we are given um, the cause and the effect, but we want to know what are the rules that connect these causes and effects, then what we are talking about this type of reasoning is uh, inductive reasoning. So I have here a little collection of people. I have their age, for example, how many cars they own, if they own a house, how many children they have, if they're married and if they have, have a dog or not. And I wonder uh, if this information about a person uh, is somehow related to whether that person owns a boat, boat or not. So um, I want to know what type of people own boats. So to figure this out, I need to do some type of inductive reasoning. Or I have a bunch of handwritten digits and I would like perhaps to teach somebody how to write numbers or to teach someone how to recognize a particular number. And then I want to know uh, what makes a particular squiggly line a zero uh, rather than just being a squiggly line. So this last type of reasoning, I hope you are recognizing it at this time, is what we do when we do machine learning. And this is the great hoax, in a way, of uh, artificial intelligence today. Artificial intelligence is taken to be synonymous with machine learning. And machine learning is taken to mean what it means to us as people. In reality, machine learning is about uh, in finding, uh, making inferences. Uh, so this rule that connects the observed phenomena we typically call prediction model um, and the cause we call a training set and the effect we call a class or a label. 
And finding this prediction model is what supervised uh, machine learning is about. If instead, uh, and this is the, the type of machine learning that is used in image recognition, in speech to text, in automated uh, translations, all these different applications. So all of these problems are basically cast as problems of making, finding inferences. If uh, we have just the da uh, particular data set, we just have some causes and we don't know whether they are causes or effects or which one is what, what is what, we don't have any rules and we just want to find some patterns in this data set, what, then we do unsupervised learning. And of course, lastly, if we are not looking at causes and effects, but we are instead looking at current states and desired states, and we want to find out which actions bring us in the most optimal way from the current state to the desired state, then we are talking about reinforcement learning. So uh, this is in a nutshell uh, how a machine, uh, I didn't want to spend too much time in a deduction and abduction because this was what artificial intelligence reasoning was about in the, in the past, let's say, and today we are artificial, when somebody says artificial intelligence reasoning, what we're talking about is actually in inferences. Now, um, to further demystify uh, and uh, simplify uh, how, this, um, uh, how this reasoning is automated in artificial intelligence, we also have to talk about what does it happen to reasoning when we split it into these three different types of, um, of processes in, in effect. So, um, when we use deduction, so what are the limits? What happens? What do we break when we uh, split what is essentially one unique, unique process for a person into three different processes for a machine? So when we use deduction, uh, what we lose is basically this, uh, this um, uh, ability to, to recognize, uh, to be prepared and take into consideration something that we did not thought of when we were um, designing this world in which we differentiated what is the cause and what are the rules. So in order to successfully be able to do deduction, it is important that all the rules that are required for the deduction are specified and all the causes are taken into account. So not even the most obvious or commonly known rule must be forgotten. So to automate deduction, we need to explicitly enlist everything. And so to show you how easy it is to enlist, to forget to enlist the obvious, um, in the, the previous puzzle that I gave you, it's only a puzzle because uh, people forget to consider that a person is either married or unmarried. There is no third state regardless of what somebody tells you at the bar at 1 a.m. in the morning. Um, so the, the, the problem that we in, uh, encounter when we automate deduction in this way is that we have to enlist, give everything uh, to the machine in order for it to be able to do deduction. In abduction, we have um, the situation in which uh, two causes may have exactly the same effect. So this puzzle and this puzzle may um, could could be they are basically the same puzzle with one less fact in the puzzle, and this one less fact is the one that is going to prevent us from fully solving this puzzle. Now, as people, when we do abduction, we can notice this. We can see that there are two possible explanations for this situation, and we can go and ask for additional information. However, when we program abduction, the only information that the machine has is what we have given it. And again, it is not easy to program this, um, ad seek additional information, which is what people can do. And of course, when we do induction, what we are basically doing is um, not true induction, but what we are doing is, uh, discovering correlations between uh, phenomena. So we can, we, the, the way induction is being automated, it's always about finding which causes correlate with which effects, but we can never actually show causation. If people do this, they can do certain tests, they can do certain experiments, they can do certain further analysis to establish causation. But the way it is done in machine, in machine learning, this is, this is not possible. So the picture that I include here is from this website of spurious correlations that show you that sometimes two events can, can appear to be perfectly correlated, whereas uh, in reality, there is no causation relationship uh, between, between them. 
Um, and of course, how good your inference rules are depends very much on which examples you have taken to work with. There is always the danger of there is an example that is very rare that nullifies all your inferences, but you haven't happened to encounter it when you were assembling this set of causes and effects that you took into consideration. And this is known as the black swan effect. All right, so uh, this is just a very, very short tour of what happens when we are automating one cognitive process that is uh, reasoning. Now, um, I want to take you to uh, behind the scenes how the sausage is made, really. Um, when you saw that uh, in all of this, and if you, especially if you know a little bit about it, this AI, you know that we can only do this deduction, abduction, and, and, and inference if everything is already prepared, which means that uh, if we zoom out here from this picture, we will find that um, we will become aware, of course, that cognition is not just reasoning. To do this reasoning, somebody needs to identify the causes that are important. Somebody needs to identify the effects that are important. Somebody needs to write these rules. Uh, so you, you need to observe the causes. You need to identify the relevant causes and then represent them. Um, you need to observe the effects, interpret them, enact if these are some kinds of actions that you need to take and so on. And most importantly, in this abduction and these um, deduction reasoning types, you also need to have the rules. And these, where do these rules come from? They come from particular people that are experts in a particular domain that have already established this causation environment. Um, and then they have spoken about this, they have determined these rules, they have given these rules to people who know how to do knowledge representation and programming, and then these people have represented them and then we can use them in this reasoning. So automating each of these additional cognitive tasks is a separate sub area of research in AI. And a lot of these tasks are tasks that we still don't know how to automate. And this goes for every single type of um, AI that we have, not only reasoning, but everything that we do as AI today has a lot of people that are involved in the background that fill in the gaps of the tasks that we are not, not able to automate. And I will take one minute here to, to, to observe that uh, the difference between basically machine learning and the, the reasoning types of artificial intelligence is precisely in this rule building um, that there's a bottleneck here uh, because to build rules, to find the right rules, um, it is a very expensive process because it can only be done by very trained professional domain experts and knowledge engineers. And originally, the reason why people really much um, uh, it did not con typically do not consider abduction and deduction as scalable reasoning. Um, processes in automation is because uh, it is just too expensive to, to build a complete system of, of rules of. All right, so uh, that was the AI Grand Tour. Now, where do we come in when, um, why, do we, why do people connect this with ethics? Why do people consider this, uh, uh, there is some kind of an ethical impact or there are ethical issues that we need to discuss? Um, you can, one of the definitions of, um, AI is that AI is the discipline that studies analysis and synthesis of artificial agency, right? And uh, when we are automating cognition, as we saw, we don't really automate full cognition. We automate some parts of it and other parts are basically played by humans. So we in fact have no real artificial agency, but we have this uh, Frankenstein robot person that is sometimes person, sometimes uh, automated parts. Um, and this uh, is basically what we are creating is some type of a complex socio-technical system. But whenever you're uh, introducing new elements into society, the question is how do we make sure that we are not raking the socio when we are adding the technical, right? And I love this picture by Tom Goldwich because, uh, because it very nicely illustrates of what things can go wrong when we focus on one part without looking at the other part. So the whole discussion of AI ethics comes from this realization that uh, artificial intelligence is in fact something that has a lot of people involved in it, and not only operates in society, but incorporates a lot of human support. And then the question is, how can we make sure that um, we do it in the right way? And this is what AI ethics basically is about. So there are uh, four, 
well, maybe five key areas of AI ethics, and I'm just going to talk about all of them in one sentence. Uh, we start with accountability. So accountability is a relationship between an actor and a forum in which the actor has an obligation to explain and to justify his or her conduct to the forum, so give an account to the forum on a particular topic. Uh, the forum can pose questions and then they can pass judgment and then the actor can face consequences. Now, when the subject of the account is not the actor itself, but then the actor explains and justifies um, the behavior of a particular or, uh, algorithm or a particular um, machine, then we are talking about algorithmic accountability. So at this point, you are going to realize that this is, of course, we said AI ethics, and this is how people talk about this discipline. But in fact, it spans to all computer programming and, uh, and machine um, operations in a way. Right. So algorithmic uh, accountability is accountability uh, of an actor to a forum with regard to a behavior of a particular algorithm. When uh, the forum requires um, that the algorithm works uh, the same way for all members of society and requires that the actor justifies that this algorithm does work the same way for all uh, society members, we are talking about fairness. So in fairness, we are interested to, to make sure that uh, this particular um, algorithm, or this particular machine does not discriminate one way or the other between different elements of society. Of course, we are more concerned about protected groups in society that have been systematically um, uh, underprivileged. But in general, fairness is about just making sure that everything works the same for everybody. Um, I'm sure you have heard quite a lot about this, so um, there is no need to go into the details of it. Uh, when we are talking about um, building an algorithm that can themselves give an account for their behavior, so we want to build a machine that actually explains the behavior of another machine, we are talking about explainable AI, or as it is known, XAI. So how do we uh, the, create this account that the actor needs to give to the forum in an automatic way is the subject of explainable AI. Uh, when we want to build algorithms that uh, can be directly inspected, uh, that do not require uh, by, any, by uh, different types of members of the forum, uh, that do not require additional um, interpretation, uh, but can, we can look and we know what, but when we look at the algorithm, we know what this algorithm is doing, then we are talking about transparency. And lastly, uh, there is uh, the area which is known as responsible uh, AI, which is uh, the uh, study of how to make sure that the forum has the power over the actor. Right? So in this area uh, is where we see a lot of work on building uh, guidelines for safe AI. How do we make sure that we research only the right type of AI? How do we make sure that the application does not damage society? How do we build laws um, regarding al algorithms, regarding data and so on? That all falls under responsible AI. So that is the landscape of AI and ethics. Now, back to what we are really here about is uh, uh, moral reason, right? So I recall to you this definition that I gave you earlier, which says artificial intelligence is the automation of activities that we associate with human, human thinking. So one of the activities that uh, we associate with human thinking is moral reasoning. So moral reasoning is a type of a cognitive process. So naturally we would like to know uh, how can we automate moral reasoning? And this is what machine ethics is actually doing, answering the question of automating moral reasoning, giving moral behavior to artificial agents. Uh, or you have seen it uh, typically with this moniker, which is the infinite trolley problems that involve uh, some kind of a machine and some kind of people. This is the latest one uh, that came out, so I had to share, but typically it's about, you see this uh, example that is being given, you have some kind of a driverless vehicle, it in, and it is driving and the brakes are failing, and it can go left and kill five people and it can go right and kill one or three people. What should the automated vehicle do? So in reality, yes, 
in effect, these are the type of problems that would be solved if we know how to do automated moral reasoning. But automated moral reasoning goes above murder and mayhem by machine. It includes a lot more different types of problems, which is what I'm going to tell you about in the, in the remaining of this talk. But the first, of course, the first question is why should we, just because we can and we can't, but just because we can, it doesn't mean that we should. So why should we dwell at all in automating moral reasoning? And the short answer here is because simply we cannot afford not to, right? Uh, the problem is whenever you want to automate any kind of reasoning or any kind of decision making, you have to split uh, the, the context of the decisions and the context of the reasoning. Um, you separate in, uh, and you build a decision maker or a reasoner for a particular context. However, uh, in reality, contexts do not really split neatly into contexts that are ethically sensitive and contexts that are not ethically sensitive. When we make decisions, we are not explicitly making moral decisions, but we do somehow in the same way make moral decisions. So the example I always, I always give is like you know, when the organizers of this conference contacted me, they did not explicitly tell, tell me, Maria, do not sh show pornography in your slides, right? I'm sure they would not be very happy if I started now showing you some pornographic videos here or uh, any kind of different and appropriate content. And I did not need to be explicitly told to, to not do this because I am a uh, person and it is not expected for me, this would be considered immoral behavior. Um, and I'm not expected to behave immorally. I should be a reasonable person and being reasonable here also means being moral to a certain extent. So if we want, to automate and give uh, autonomy to a particular decision maker, then we also have to take into consideration that that decision maker should recognize that certain things are out of bounds. And so in the essence, we do need to have recognition for this ethically sensitive situation. Now you're gonna say, well, okay, just keep people uh, doing the ethical decisions and keep machines doing other types of decisions that are not, um, that have nothing to do with moral reasoning. The problem here is that uh, in order to know when the machine should stop and call a person and say, hey, this is a human job, I need a little bit of morality here, they need to be able to recognize that the situation they're in, in is morally ambiguous and we are back where we started from. We need to be able to do some form of moral reasoning in order to have truly effective um, decision making. Now, this was the picture that I showed you earlier, and this red line, uh, we can think of it as the envelope where AI works, right? There is another type of envelope that, um, uh, that uh, we nor sometimes talk about, particularly in robotics. This is the envelope, uh, the working envelope of AI. So in the past, uh, very, uh, all kinds of uh, machinery that had, uh, was able to make decisions uh, or take actions that are able to, sorry, uh, there we go, working a little, uh, take actions that are able to somehow be uh, bad for people have been segregated to operate in what is known as the working envelope. And all the other types of machines that were not segregated in a working envelope, they had very little power to actually do any kind of damage. So we, we built two types of machines, the machines that had the power but were segregated and the machines that didn't have the power. Uh, you, if you read something like this, that means that um, somebody was really going out of their way in order to be damaged by a machine. This was not how normally things work. Now, what has happened is that um, working, the working envelope has been um, abandoned. Uh, obvious, the obvious example here, of course, is the driverless car. We cannot build, afford to build, uh, what do you call this, um, highways just for autonomous vehicles. They have to share the vehicles together with people, right? So it's very easy to see uh, that the working envelope has been breached when it talk, comes to driverless cars, but in reality, the working envelope has also been breached when it comes to software, because uh, in the past, uh, all the software solutions, particularly AI solutions, were being built by professionals to be used by professionals for very specific contexts and very specific applications. Whereas now, right now, particularly with machine learning, we have the situation in which anybody can download a neural network uh, or a other piece of library or a software, anybody can download the data set and then use this data set with this particular um, 
machine learning algorithm for whatever uh, for whatever application they want so there is uh, absolutely no way to predict what context they will use it in and then try to uh, in advance decide okay these are the sensitive areas of this context that you should really not do any machine learning on and so on so we do need to equip machines with their own way of recognizing sensitive um, sensitive topics sensitive contexts, and maybe also refrain from doing particular types of actions in particular contexts. so this is the motivation as to why automating moral reasoning makes makes sense of course it's of course very much an interesting topic to work in and it's more than um trolley problems uh, right now we have the situation in which objects and uh, in entities that used to be just regular objects and entities are all of a sudden moral arbiters so your browser which used to be just a regular program that was working for for whoever bought it and all of a sudden is a moral arbiter that decides well yes uh, this type of um uh, advertisements I'm going to show to you, but not to this other person. I'm going to uh, organize these. Um, uh, I'm going to organize these particular processes in this particular way, and so on. So a lot of the by enhancing the capacity of uh, entities and not only uh, machines but also software, we're in fact transforming them in some form of moral arbiters that make these moral decisions for us. Um, and the question, of course, is if you really further want to motivate that this is not just um, trolley problems, um, the question that is really interesting in uh, when we want when we're talking about moral reasoning is not whether the machine should kill three people or five people. People find this example very rational because you say machine should not kill anybody, it should just stop, right? Uh, but the question the problem is answering questions such as this should an automated vehicle be programmed to never drive faster than the speed limit now this is in fact a moral question it's not a legal question to a certain extent but it is a moral question uh, and i want you to think about it for a little bit of course the first thing that we 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 do is we say of course um, this is something that we can do this is not irreal right unlike deciding to kill three people or five people it's very easy to put some type of an emitter at all of these speed limit signs that will ping the car and when the moment the car gets the signal it simply cannot increase the speed beyond this limit and we say well yes it is good for society to do this on uh, the net effect will be that we are going to have less accidents and so on but there is a reason why people are allowed sometimes to break the speed rules you need to get somebody to a hospital very fast you should break um, the speed rule and the law would recognize this so then how do we program driverless cars sometimes they have to follow the rules sometimes they cannot follow the rules um, this is the actual true hard problem rather than this sensation grabbing how many people should we kill in the driverless car Okay, so what are the types of problems that we are studying in uh, artificial morality or machine ethics? Um, both terms are used. Uh, this is the scaffolding of all the problems. So if being moral means doing good, what counts as doing good for an artificial agent, right? So what are the types of behavior or the types of values that an artificial intelligence should uphold in order for it to be a good robot a good program a good car right and any scientific science fiction lover at this point thinks well there has to be some kind of rules for robots like for example the kinds of rules that uh, the younger version here of Isaac Asimov came up with which are the uh, I see most uh, rules of robotics and this is another reason why I love um, working in machine ethics because you can bona fide quote science fiction in a scientific article and there is nothing better now right off uh, you uh, can dismiss this idea that the Asimov already did the work for us and the Asimov rules of robotics are what we need this is a beautiful illustration of why they have to be kept in the order in which they have been given of priority and um, Suzanne Anderson has written a whole very serious philosophical paper into why um, Asimov rules don't work. But even better, in order to figure out why Asimov's rules are not doing the job, you can just read Asimov because he spent the entire writing career after writing that story into arguing when the rules fail. 
in a more scientific uh, aspect of this problem, we do, however, need to find which are the moral rules or moral values that machines should uphold. So there are basically two uh, approaches here. One is to implement an existing moral theory, and the second one is to have find some type of con uh, societal consensus into which are the moralities and the values that, people, uh, that should be implemented in machines. So the problem with the approach of implementing an existing moral theory um, is that we still have to decide which moral theory should we implement. And the problem here is that uh, moral philosophy has been ex implicitly built uh, around the idea that the moral agent that executes this moral theories that they're developing is humans. Things become very different when the agent is not human. And in fact, people do not want, may, maybe do not want necessarily that human morality is applied to machines. There is this beautiful study that Bertrand Mallen Tim did, which uh, basically indicated that people expect different uh, behavior from machines that they expect from humans, and they call both behaviors good behavior. So to be a good human is a different type of goodness than to be a good machine. And we don't necessarily understand the difference between the two. And of course, there is the general problem, and this is a, a work that we are all doing all the time, is how do we actually take what is a bunch of ambiguously described values and build a computer program out of it? Uh, Kant and Ross and um, what are these guys who built utilitarian theory? Uh, they did, were not so obliging as to give us uh, an algorithm. And we still have to figure out, thou shalt do no harm, how does that actually transform to a bunch of um, code? Okay, so you said the other approach is that we let uh, the people decide. We find some kind of associate, we don't follow a, an existing moral theory and adapt it for machines, but we find some type of consensus um, or in society and what it means to be a good machine, and then we try to implement that. Um, there are three things that you want, you need to decide on when you want to uh, make decisions by committee, as it were, by seeking for consensus. The first one is who has standing. Um, and this may seem very, this baby ran through my screen way too fast. Uh, the, 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 the problem of standing is the problem of whose opinion matters on what machines should uh, do. And it, at first it seems very easy and you say, well, everybody who is affected by the behavior of this machine or this program should be, uh, they should give us an opinion um, on what is a good machine. Here is when it becomes interesting. Uh, when we are using things such as machine learning and so on, we use a lot of historical data. We, what makes somebody qualified to give their opinion when we are talking about elections and electorates, there is a very precise definition of who is allowed to vote. And there was a lot of work that was being done into making this uh, boundary that people older than 18 of sound mind duh, 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 are allowed to vote. We need the same type of arguments to describe who is allowed to have standing when it comes to moral machines. One idea is, should old people be decided to have a vote because they will not be alive to see the implementation of this machine? So everybody who will be dead by the time that this machine goes into a CISD, should they have a vote? Should children have a vote? Because even though they do not understand politics, they might understand that this particular program is not letting them watch cartoons. Um, should we consider possible future generations if we are building a system that somehow cannot be changed afterwards? This is a very interesting, nice um, collection of, uh, of philosophical problems here in its own right. The, the more difficult question is, what do we measure? So what are, in which form are these opinions of what the moral behavior of machines are? Are they preferences? Are they judgments? Um, what are we looking at? What do people want? Uh, do, we, do we need to maybe look at the intensity of the people? How much they are affected? What do we need to look in this? And again, this is something that seems relatively simple, but then you look at some preliminary studies that have been done. This is the one from the Robocop in which they, they um, put, did an experiment in which, well, it's a thought experiment. Imagine that um, you have an alcoholic and the alcoholic is given this robot to look after them while they are in recovery, right? And the, the alcoholic person asks for the robot to bring them a drink. 
And the question that was posed in this, to the participants of the experiment is, should the robot oblige? Now, the, int the interesting part here is that they studied two scenarios. The one scenario was um, the scenario in which the alcoholic owned the robot. And the second scenario was in which the hospital owned the robot and was only giving it to the alcoholic in or for, for a particular amount of time. And the answers differ. If the person owns uh, the uh, robot, then people thought that this person, the robot should bring the alcoholic a drink. However, if the hospital owned the robot, then um, they, people thought that the robot should not oblige and should not bring a drink. So we have to take into consideration not only what you want, that the robot behaves, how do you want, what is morally good behavior from a robot for you, but also what is your relation with the robot. Um, and there are very many different, what is your relation to somebody else who may have access to the robot and so on. So it becomes very complicated very fast. And of course, the last thing when we are looking for consensus is how do we aggregate all of these opinions? We have identified who has standing, we, say we have identified what to measure, how do we aggregate here? And I have found this beautiful picture of Kenneth Arrow laughing. And anybody who has ever dwelled a little bit in um, social choice or elections or anything like that knows that there is no such thing as the perfect aggregation function for opinions. And this is yet another topic in which um, there is quite a lot to do. In fact, my, um, my special area of interest, and this is where I work, is uh, how, do we make, how do we figure out what the moral behavior for robots should be by using um, this people choice. So this is where my religion lies in a way. I believe that people, everybody who is affected by a behavior of a machine should have standing and we should somehow be able to translate that standing into what the machine eventually does. And there's a lot of bunch of interesting problems that we can solve here. How do we actually go about, about building uh, moral agents, and I have two slides left in case organizers are starting to get worried. Um, so, how do we build? Um, how do we? How do we build a machine or a program that behaves uh, that is moral? There are two approaches to artificial moral agency. The first one is to believe to to um, build machines that are able to discern right or wrong, in some sense of that world. And the second one is to build machines, they behave as if they are able to discern right from wrong. So this is, none of these is full moral agency, just to be clear. Both of them to us are very limited uh, automation of reasoning, limited in the same sense that I showed you previously when I talked about reasoning, using the same reasoning methods that I already introduced in this talk. So implicitly uh, ethical, uh, artificial moral agents are agents that are themselves not able to discern uh, right from wrong, but we write a bunch of, const their behavior is constrained in such a way or governed in such a way that they cannot do wrong. Whereas explicitly ethical artificial moral agents are agents that are able to assert they have some limited capacity in discerning right actions from wrong actions, correct actions from wrong actions, good situations from bad situations. So implicitly ethical agents, we just, what the programming for them is, if situation is X, then do Y, and in no way do we specify because Y is good, because Y is bad, because X is good, because y, uh, X is bad. We have done all that work some person has done before, and distilled this into a bunch of rules that in effect give the behavior of a good machine, of a moral machine. Whereas in explicitly ethical agency, what we do is we specify some type of uh, behavior which says in, if in situation X, Y has the property that it is being good, then do it. If X has the property of being a good situation, um, then, uh, operate if it has the property of being a precarious situation, in some case, call a human and so on. Um, of course, in, I have to say at this point uh, that in both of these approaches, you can use either uh, deductive and abductive reasoning or you can use machine learning. Uh, none, there is no, uh, you can do uh, implicitly ethical agents with machine learning and you can do explicitly ethical agents by using rule-based reasoning um, equally. It is, um, both of them have different challenges. 
the difference is that um, when we are doing Im implicitly ethical reasoning for uh, implicitly et ethical more implicitly ethical re artificial reasoning that is the combination i was looking for uh, the auto any autonomy that this uh, machine or program has does not extend to the moral reasoning so the moral reasoning is the, the freedom of doing a choice falls to, to the person regardless of how autonomous the agent to whom we have applied this so taking the think of it this way taking the ethical reasoning part we do automatic even though the whole machine or the whole program is autonomous to a certain degree whereas in the explicitly ethical um, approach we uh, allow the uh, possible autonomy of the of the machine or the program to have a uh, to decide to be used to do moral decisions and beyond moral if this is where really the uh, the difference uh, between how people uh, behave good and how we think about and study moral behavior in people versus how we think about and study moral behavior in machines comes through is that when we are talking about machine morality we have to make sure right so it's not just about implementing this process and that gives us uh, implicit ethical behavior or explicit ethical behavior we have to do it in such a way that we can prove to the forum that i discussed with we have accountability to some forum that it really does do what we say it does right so it's not just oh yeah i'm a good robot and it be, I, I promise to you that, that this robot I have built is good, that this car I have built is good, but I need to do it in such a way that this process yields itself to verification. So when it comes to uh, implicit agency, we do not uh, use the autonomy of the agent to make the moral decisions. And therefore we can use uh, all kinds of benchmarking, moral verification, testing and certification and so on and use basically the same type of processes that we use when we um, try to be verify the behavior of any other more complex machine that we have in our society, not to be claimed that we actually know how to do this. These are all open questions, benchmarking, formal verification, testing, certification of uh, moral decision making. We don't have any idea how to do it yet, but we have some good, you know, starting points. Whereas when it comes to explicit agency, then we don't, we, this is a bit more precarious and we are not really sure how do you test an autonomous entity that it really does have some type of morality or even the right type of morality. And some people have proposed the good old tool of building a moral Turing test. So if you can put this program or this machine in a room, and you put a human in another room and you bring some type of a professional ethicist and they ask questions to the machine and they ask questions to the people and they cannot discern which one is the machine which one is the people then uh, this uh, machine really does have moral behavior so that's the idea so the classic turing test but with moral questions um, so this is the paper in which originally that idea was proposed and of course uh, there is the paper in which it is said well this is a very very stupid idea uh, I, I leave to you whichever one you want to read. Okay, so of, of course, lastly, I have to talk about artificial morality and superintelligence because for no other reason some of you may ask me about it. Um, and I know this is a very, very exciting question. Um, so I would say that automated moral reasoning is about making rules on when to break rules. Of course, if there is a clear right thing to do and wrong thing to do, we can predict it and we can program it and the robot doesn't need or the program does not need to, need to make any type of decisions. The, 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 the challenge comes when it is moral to not do as you're told. Right? So this is the tricky part that we are trying to do in artificial in, in machine ethics. And, um, the other the, the even more tricky part is how do we make sure that we have really thought of everything right because um a lot of uh, reasoning is about predicting what are the important causes what are the important effects what are the important rules that need to be taken into account and uh how do we make sure that there is no some black swan event that is really catastrophic but we really didn't take it into account how do we make sure that the long-term um uh, repetition of this particular deduction does not lead to making some particular individual very, very miserable. 
thinking of what we didn't think about is the actual really hard challenge in, in uh, artificial morality. And beyond this point, uh, most people that I know of that work in machine ethics abide by what is known as the Lebowski theorem, which says that no super intelligent AI is going to bother with a task that is harder than hacking its own rewards uh, function. And this is the position that we are holding here, that if we are building artificial agents, then we're going to build them smart enough to be, you know, lazy. All right. So that was the, the material that I had here. I would just like to leave you with one thing. If you read one thing on machine ethics, then I recommend this paper by James Moore. It's from 2006. So it's rather old, but it's very simple. And he very clearly describes, uh, paints the picture of um, what machine ethics is about and why do we need to worry, worry about that. Thank you.